Kappa Theater, January 3rd, 2022. It's the first time I've said the term 2022. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, the yeah. Doug Neckers. Yeah. And it was at the same Kappa Theater many moons ago, almost 20 years ago, where you sat here on a, on a query and a, and a cur piece of curiosity. And uh, next thing you know, you ended up being chairman of the board. How did, how did you... How did that all get started? Well, that's really interesting, I think, because what happened was I'm a product of a liberal arts college, as are you. Liberal arts college is a place where people at least are introduced to a smattering of things through other courses other than their majors. I'm a chemist. I was a chemist, died in the wool chemist all the way through my undergraduate programs. But we had to take various things outside our field. One of the courses I took was was you uh, was uh, European history from 1815 on, right? So this is after Napoleon. Now, of course, the book stopped at that point because books were not republished very often. So World War II was the end of our history book. And I don't know if they got to Nuremberg or not, but I loved the course. I just thought it was really interesting, taught by a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and not really a Holocaust survivor, but a Holocaust avoider. He got out of, was lucky enough to get out of Austria in uh, uh, 38 or 39, brought by uh, uh, the Reformed Church, ended up teaching at Hope College, which was a college of, run by the Reformed Church, and spent his whole career there. Well, it comes time, I'm a senior, I'm going to graduate school in the fall in chemistry, and it comes time to write a term paper for my professor. Professor Paul Freed is his name. <clears throat> and I said, well, I, you know, I like music, I want to write on Beethoven. Uh, anybody can write about Beethoven, that's not secret, you know. Why don't you t t tackle the case of I.G. Farben? I said, who? I knew that Farben meant color in German, but I didn't know anything about it, so I said, well, what do you find out about Farben? Then I remember that one of my professors talked about various uh, cartels that were formed in Germany in the businesses of chemistry after World War I. Uh, and didn't say much except there was a great uh, brouhaha about the strength of these cartels because the United States and the Allies, but more the United States, had at the uh, instigation of the Wilson administration in 1917, uh, instituted something called the a Alien Property Act. And the major property the Alien Property Act took were chemical companies, chemical patents, and things that related to chemistry. So while well, that starts to get interesting, so who was farming? Well, this is Holland, Michigan, it's, you know, 1960, and you're still using books, you don't have Xerox machines, you don't have cell phones, you don't have Google, you don't have Wikipedia, you gotta do the hard work yourself. So I looked at the library at Hope College, there's no book on Farben. Looked in the, looked in the uh, 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 encyclopedia, if there's anything on Farben, it was a little half a paragraph. And then finally found a book written by uh, one of the people that was at the Farman trial, and I can't remember now because it was one of the first books that was published on, Farman was a chemical cartel of 11 different chemical companies who got together officially in 1925 and fixed prices on things from dyes and, and films and anything and everything that you might, you might want to buy for your consumer issues, they fixed prices uh, across the board. They basically were, essentially they were the Nazis later, they were the mo Nazis chemical monopoly. And if you listen to the leadership of Farben in 1938, 39, 40, they had the intention of taking, all, taking over all chemical manufacturing in the world in the same way the Nazis really wanted to take control of the world. So I got this book and I started to read and I thought, oh, that's pretty interesting. But I was a college graduate. I'd had four years of chemistry. My first organic course, as I said in the newspaper here last week, was at the same time that Jim Cott said he was going from Chattanooga to uh, Washington in the fall. Same exact time I took my first organic course. So I went to graduate school, became an organic chemist. Uh, sort of put it on the back burner when my career was developing and so on. And then we had 
purchased uh, property in Bemis Point, and Suzanne and I, and my wife and I, would come just periodically for R and R. And um, not we have to. There was a day before. Stop for one second. Yeah. Your shirt's got a tag. Oh, there's, I know. Can, a, can, you, can you cut it off? <laughs> I wish I could. But no. just, yeah, just tuck just it in. Yeah. Just sort of Let's pull it. I knew. I saw that. I didn't say. My expensive shirts are in Toledo. I okay, guess. There you I don't go. Know. Very, very good. Sorry. Yeah. You're talking Susan. Yeah, okay. So Suzanne and I bought property in Bemis that belonged to her father. Mm -hmm. Her father and mother. Dick Evans was the chair of the Board of Supervisors in Chautauqua County. At the time, the supervis supervisors' form of government uh, was terminated and the legislat legislative form of government began. I, I can't tell you when that was, but it was in the 80s, I think. Anyway, um, so we bought this property on Chautauqua Lake, and we'd, we'd come here. I was a department head at Bowling Green, and it was stressful, and we had kids in college, and it was stressful to be paying tuition, all that sort of stuff. So we'd sometimes take just weekends and come and hope to get snowed in. You know, it happened a few times. But in this particular weekend, I picked up the Post Journal. We actually did something then that we don't do now. We actually read hard copy newspapers. You know? okay. So I go to Marsh's Grocery Store in, Bem in Bemis Point. Like those people dearly. Uh, John Marsh is still a very good friend. His kids, some of them, you know, I know. And I bought, I always buy the Times, New York Times, and the Jamestown Post Journal. And I read the Post Journal, and there's this little... I don't think it was more than an inch, maybe an inch and a half, about the Jackson Center interviewing three or four Nuremberg prosecutors. I said, what? In Jamestown? You know, no, this is me from Clymer. I mean, well, my, my standard's high, right? Okay, what's going on in Jamestown? So I, so, but that was on Wednesday, I think, okay? So Suzanne and I went back because I had stuff to do on Monday and Tuesday, and then Tuesday night we came back, and Wednesday we came here. I think it was in the morning, was it not? And so uh, I then meet and listen to Whitney Harris and uh, 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 Henry King and, and uh, Melzer, Bernie Melzer, and, and uh, there was another guy who's not. James Conway. Yeah, he wasn't a prosecutor, was he? It was subsequent trial. Subsequent trial. Okay, so, and the first thing that happened was Melzer got up and said, um, you know, I was too young, so I couldn't make the case against who? Well, Helmer von Scott. But Helmer von Scott's middle name was Henler, Helmer, Helmer Horst Greeley von Scott. Suddenly, Clymer's in the middle of my day, right? <laughs> okay. But fast forward to that story. So uh, I have to tell you, I sat here absolutely mesmerized by the conversations that happened with Whitney Harris and Henry King and Melzer. I don't remember Conway or Conway much. Uh, mesmerized is just absolutely the right word. And that took me back to those, that one book I had on Farben. Uh, and I went back to read. Now I had a PhD. I'd been teaching for 35 years. I knew a lot more organic chemistry than I did at the time I was assigned that term paper by my, my professor at, at, uh, uh, at uh, Hope College. And I got to thinking, I wonder if these guys know about that, these guys being you, Greg. I mean, these guys being the guys that were in the front row. So the first thing that happened is you brought Ben Ferencz here. And I don't know if it was Don was here, but Ben was here, I remember, with uh, Kaming. What was Kaming? Bill Kaming. Bill, Bill Kaming. And I have a beautiful picture of Sue, Bill Kaming, and, and Ben Ferencz walking up the front yard. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it's a gorgeous picture. Uh, and so I said to Ben, now, Eli, Mrs. Rosenbaum, tells me you were at the Farben trial. And I said, can you tell me something about the chemists? He looked at me and said, chemists? There weren't any chemists at the Farben trial. I mean, we were chemists. It was all chemists. Well, in fact, what he was focusing on was the actions of the chemists and the actions of Farben. The fact that there were individuals involved, he missed. That was my interpretation. Okay. And then we have this marvelous picture that I got from Eli of the judgment at the Farben trial. Farben was the chemical cartel tried in, in trial six, started in August of 1947, ended in July of 1948, with 13, I think, people convicted, but nobody more than eight years. Farben's, some of the Farben, uh, one of the Farben units was 
was a uh, uh, parent of desal sugar, so desal sugar, desal sugar, which was a plant in Dessau in Germany where the for people that might see this, the Bauhaus is so the, the modern, uh, modernist uh, office furniture furniture uh, school. Uh, Dessau Sugar was where they uh, hydrolyzed sugar beets down to the very end, and then took the amygdalin that was left, heated it, and out of that came hydrogen cyanide, which they bubbled into cans of clay uh, under pressure and then sealed. That became Cyclone B. So. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, fascinated by all of that, right? Farben, Cyclone B, Farben, you know, uh, Dessau, uh, Soiker was a division of one of the bigger companies in Farben. And so, in fact, then Farben was connected to, uh, well, how do you follow this forward? Well, you follow it forward by looking for people. And there was a name in the list of people in the, uh, in the Farben group by the name of Fritz Termeer. Now, I'm a good Dutchman. Tamir means at the sea in Dutch. What's this Dutchman doing working for the Nazis? Okay. I mean, it is a thought process. This is the intellectual history of all this. So, Fritz Tamir. Um, so, I, I began thinking about who Tamir was, where he came from, and why he would be working for, well, it turns out he's German. And he was born in the Ruhr, and his father was a person who started a chemical company that made all the nitro, uh, nitrotoluene, nitrobenzene, all those explosive devices that, you know, made all the money for a chemical company during World War I and World War II. Fritz took it over from his father and eventually became, in Farben, the head, the highest placed chemist in all of Farben. Okay. Now, at this point, we're talking about things that happened after the Nuremberg trial, per se which was the International Military Tribunal. But um, these guys probably were the engine that made the Nazi party, that made the Nazi regime run. So Farben, Fritz Termeer, Dessau, Dessau Schuker, eventually Cyclone B. Well, how's that connection work, right? Where's it, how did Eichmann get Cyclone B from this group of chemists that were distilling products from sugar beets. I mean, this is the organic chemistry and the history in organic chemistry. So how do they do that? Well, it turns out that, that uh, they would package this Cyclone B and send it up the Elba River to Hamburg, where there was a company called Tesch and Stabenow. Stabenow as in the senator from Michigan, Debbie Stabenow or Stabenow, right? Stabenow wasn't involved, but Bruno Tesch was. And then Tesch sold those cans of Cyclone B to the SS, where they used it for the uh, chamber, gas chambers at the, at the killing, Auschwitz being the, the biggest. So Bruno Tesch from sugar beets, poisons that kill, well, how many do we think? Two million, the number just depends on. And then Whitney Harris was sitting here on that day way back when, and the question came up, well, he happened, well, maybe this was at a time when we interviewed Whitney separately, separately. And, and you and I did. And the question came up, so uh, there's this guy uh, uh, who is uh, the commander of Auschwitz, right? Rudolf Hirsch. Right, I know I was going to say it, okay. but you got it. <laughs> Rudolf, you know, has with this, right. And you managed to, this is what Whitney said, now, I don't know if this is exactly the way it worked, but Whitney said, the British found this guy working on a chicken farm in northeast Germany, and I found out about it, and I said, well, bring the guy here. And he, I'd depose him. That's basically what he said, didn't he? He said that I did it. I'm talking about Whitney Harris uh, in, the, in the context of getting Hess to, to, uh, to Nuremberg. And, and then he said we started interviewing Hess, and Hess basically argued about whether it was two million or two million three or whatever. The argument was not that he killed all these people, it was the few thousand we might have gotten directly different, right? So Hess, Stavenow, Hess, I'm sorry, it's spelled that way, you know, with an and we tend to mispronounce it. But so then Whitney brings all of the chemistry into the Nuremberg trial through his deposition of Rudolf Hess. And so it all starts to click, well, these guys were pretty important, 
right? Important for the Jackson Center to learn about. Now about this time, and you can get, correct me on this, but about this time, uh, Sid Shavitz got in touch with you guys through Fredonia College, I think, didn't Great he? Great memory, you're absolutely right. Okay, uh, Fredonia, SUNY Fredonia. And then somehow you got connected with Nashville and all that sort of stuff and you have a collection of 41 line drawings down, down in the banquet room, right? So I walked over and looked at them. Here's, I, I remember sending you a text. Uh, somewhere this starts to get to email time. Somewhere in all of this development, we start to be able to communicate by email. Now I type and you don't very well. So we had. Well, that's true. Okay, <laughs> well, I know it's true. So I was being quite, I'd send a lot of information. You'd say, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> So this is more a history of Greg Peterson than Doug Decker. That's right. I couldn't keep up. Not even <laughs> well, but so, And so I started telling you about Farben. And then I went downstairs and I looked at it. And then I had that book from Hope College, which was not the Hope College book, but I'd bought one. And it's not the DuBois book. It was before that. And I can't remember. I should have prepared myself. But, uh, and I went and looked at the book. And I looked at the book, and I looked at the picture, and I looked at the drawing downstairs of the six or eight Farben guys in the dock. And lo and behold, what Sid, who I talked to, had done was copy the mirror image. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I told you almost immediately, I know that you, you know, so what? You know, but in fact, the, the line drawing that you guys have downstairs here, beautiful thing, is backwards because the chief... Uh, the, the trial was was Carl Crouch at all. Crouch is on the right. Is that right? Anyway, it's backwards. I can't remember. It, no, it would have to have been on the left. Crouch was on the left. And so it's a mirror image. As in the, the, the big trial when Goering was on, on the left. But here, he would have been on the left if, if it had been, been, uh, been, the, been the IMT. So I showed that to various people, and the only person that could see what I was saying, now I had the book, so I knew it was wrong. I called Sid, and I said, I'm calling him Sid because his last name's hard to say, but I told him that, and he said, oh, it happens, I had 50 books that I looked at, and so on and so forth. But the only person that's ever been in that banquet hall and has seen that it's backwards is Henny Clausen from the... From the from the Nuremberg uh, courtroom, I guess she's not there anymore. But I was just here for Marion's retirement, and I was sitting with Krista McMahon and and uh, Michael Hills, and I talked a little bit about Farben, and she repeated back to me that the drawing was backwards. <laughs> so the message has gotten through into the educational process. Well, all right, then I started to see now Fritz Demir, Dutchman maybe, no, not, but who is he? Right. So then, now by this time, the internet started to click in. And for historians, the internet makes a bad historian a good historian. You know, it may, you may get bad information because Wikipedia is not reviewed and all that stuff, but it's better than nothing. So I start to look up Tamir. Well, I first off find out he's not Dutch. I secondly find out that his father, Weiler Tamir, were students of a Nobel laureate in, in the first Nobel, Nobel laureate in organic chemistry, who was eventually uh, formed the uh, research institute in Berlin uh, in organic chemistry, Emil Fischer. During, after the Franco-Prussian war, Fischer was sent with his students to Strasbourg to try and bring Strasbourg into the German, uh, Strasbourg University into the German umbrella rubric. And among the students there at that time was Fritz Demir's father. Uh, what the heck was his name? Henry, I think. Her Herbert, I don't know. Uh, so then now I'm in the university. I'm still at Bowling Green at this time. And I say, well, okay, these guys are interesting. Maybe I'll see if I can get PhD. To what they work on? What, what was their chemistry background? Now this is Tamir and Papa Tamir, Father Tamir. So I got PhD dissertations for the students 
Fritz Tamir and his father from whatever university they got their degrees from. Tamir got his degree from Humboldt University in, in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, and you may have seen pictures of that university research building with a pickle hop, you know, the, yeah. uh, on the top. Uh, Female Fisher had it. It was built for him and opened in 1915 or something. No, earlier than that, 1905. I don't know, in that time frame. Anyway, um, but so I got copies of their PhD dissertations. And how did I get them? Well, this is a Chautauqua connection. When Chautauqua got started, John Hyle Vincent wanted to have a university. Okay? And so somehow by accident, he hired a professor of Hebrew at uh, Yale who came to be his educational right hand man to set up what was thought to be education for Sunday school teachers, CLSC. And that guy's name was William Rainey Harper. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, a lot of history still to be discovered at Chautauqua Institution. A lot of world history still to be discovered. So William Haint Rainey Harper graduated from Muskingum College in Ohio, went to Yale. His thing was Hebrew and sort of, and he, he was a fine lecturer and, and whatever, but he was aggressive. And the books written about him uh, from the University of Chicago, we'll come to that in a minute, young man in a hurry. He was going to take whatever he could and build excellence in the United States. Now this is, so Harper comes to Chautauqua, starts what becomes the CLSC, and then, you know, it's sort of just, there wasn't a lot of money here. And what eventually happened is he connects with John D. Rockefeller, who has major interests in a Baptist seminary in Chicago. Harper goes to that Baptist seminary. And eventually Rockefeller funds what becomes the University of Chicago. Harper turns the University of Chicago into the first American research university. We had Harvard and they took care of all the blue buds in Harvard and in, in Cambridge and Boston. We had Yale and they were, Yale was worried about sewers at that time in chemistry. And we had Johns Hopkins and they were moving along, nothing in California. Chicago became the first American research university of consequence to compete with Munich and Berlin and, and, and uh, Jena and, and Halle and all of those major, Dresden, all of those major universities across the German state. So why was I able to get the dissertations of these guys that were German in the United States? Because Harper set up a research university with the direction, get a PhD dissertation from everybody that ever published as well. Mm. Okay? So what happened was that down the line, some of these other managers or leaders uh, and, and uh, Bayer, which uh, is Kristen's father worked for Bayer. Uh, uh, Carl Duisberg was the president of Bayer. And he, he came, he was from uh, Leverkusen, which is where the, his mother knew the, the, the father, Frederick Bayer. So he got a job there after he had finished his PhD in, in Jena in East Germany. So I was in Jena, East Germany, giving a lecture a few years ago. And I asked the people there if they had a copy of Duisberg's PhD dissertation which I already had in my, you know, I had copies of, from Chicago. And his home university, which went through the Second World War, became part of the Russian, uh, part of the Soviet Union's area of capture. Couldn't find Duisberg, who was probably their most important graduate ever, couldn't find his, his PhD dissertation. That's what Harper did in the broadest sense for higher education and, and research in American universities in the, world, in the world. And I was able to take advantage of that. So then Fritz Termeer, Weiler Termeer, he's the son, and he then gets involved with the Nazi party. In 1937, he joins the Nazi party. He becomes the highest placed chemist on the Vorstand of Farben, which is the board. And it's Fritz Termeer and Otto Ambrose who work for him. Maybe you recognize the name sure. of it? Yeah, okay. These two guys together are assigned the directive of how to make Buna rubber, how to make synthetic rubber in the East. Now they had synthetic rubber plants in Western Germany, but there was a drive pushed by Hitler and top Nazi power to set up facilities in the East. And it was Ambrose and Termeer, 
Tamir being the boss, Ambrose being the, the worker down the chain, who picked out this spot in Poland because there was Polish workers, there was water. Uh, it was a pretty easy place to get to from rail, rail services, which became Auschwitz and then Monowitz, which is where the Buna rubber plant mm -hmm. was built. And you remember when we were talking to Ernie Michel, and, uh, and Ernie Michel being, uh, uh, well, he was, he survived about eight years in concentration camps. Remind me to come back to Ernie in just a second. But he, he was talking about uh, the Buna plant and how he had to, uh, um, he, he basically couldn't say the word because he was employed in the, I guess the infirmary at Auschwitz as a, as a secretary because of his, he, he ended up taking courses in calligraphy in Mannheim. Uh, and so Buna, the plant, was built there at the direction of Fritz Tremere. Mm -hmm. These guys, and there's pictures of Tremere, Ambrose, and Hitler, Himmler really, not Hitler, at Auschwitz, making the decisions that took these people who were then not paid at the price that they were supposed to be paid, but used as slave labor to build that Buna plant, which never was completed. Okay. Now, Ernie Michel. So Ernie Michel be became Joseph Mengele, who was the doctor at Auschwitz, who did all the experiments on. Uh, and by the way, one of the things that pervades the German research community throughout this time are experiments that are quite like what Mengele was doing in Auschwitz by research groups of highest order in the universities in the country. Now they'd have five programs with one being directed towards something that had context in, in, the, in, the, in the hideous uh, ideals written in Mein Kampf that, that Hitler and, 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 and his minions felt were secrets to you know, control, third right control. So Ernie Michel uh, uh, about well, you can perhaps tell me, when did we do that Bowling Green program? When was About that? 2005. 2005. So 2005, you and uh, Christy Barton, Christy. right? And I remember we went to dinner at Belmont, and you and Christy talked often. She was setting up a program on Nuremberg, I think, the judgment at Nuremberg, okay. at Bowling Green. And you must have suggested either to her or to a historian or a psychologist maybe, who was setting up another program in memory, the name of Ernie Michel. But long story short, Ernest Michel, who by this time had been in New York for many years as the vice president for development or vice president of the United Jewish Appeal, mm -hmm. was suggested by you to them and they followed up on it. Mm -hmm. And Ernie Michel came to that memory event which was in that 2005, 2006 time frame. The, the Nuremberg event was separate. Mm -hmm. okay. separate. Yeah, yeah. So it came to that, and then you and I interviewed Ernie Michel mm -hmm. at uh, the Bowling Green Student Union. Um, and he talked then for a group of people, students and faculty and board members and all sorts of others. Uh, Sue came down and, and some of our neighbors came down and so on from Perrysburg and listen to Ernie talk. Uh, his story is just totally compelling if you haven't read his book. I mean, you and I have, but uh, what was it Less Than Slaves? I can't remember what the name of the book was, but his book about his, his years first in a, in a work camp and then going to Auschwitz, where because he could write well, Mengele used him as secretary. So the story appears about Ernie Michel in the, in the newspaper. And, uh, a friend of mine was dean of the graduate school at that time, or maybe vice president for research, and uh, uh, Jewish. And so we had, because of Nuremberg and Chautauqua, the ecumenical conversations that happen between Christians and Jews uh, are significant and uh, enable, enabled. So I give my colleagues at Chautauqua great credit. Come back to that in a minute. 
So I'm sitting in my office, and then I get a call, and he's and this Lou Katzner on the other end. He said, are you sitting down? I said, well, no, I don't think I am, but what's up? Well, about a little earlier, Lou had entertained a group, a small group of people for dinner, Lou and his wife. Among that was Sam Adler and Emily Freeman Brown. And then he went on to, and then he went on to tell me that Sam, uh, Sam's father was a cantor in Mannheim in Germany. You heard this story? Mm -hmm. He was a cantor in, 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 uh, in uh, Germany, in Mannheim, and saw the story about Ernie in the paper. And Sam, this is now Sam, who was head of composition at the Eastman School as a musician for 35 years. And at this time, he was commuting to Juilliard. He retired at age 65, and then for the next 17 years, would fly to Juilliard in New York, spend three or four days with students there and then back. His wife was director, Emily Freeman Brown was and still is director of the Bowling Green State University uh, Orchestra, right? Dear friends. So, uh, uh, can we take a break? Sure. Um, are we good at yeah. okay. take a pause. Yeah. This is what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Stop yeah, I stopped for just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Can I take a break? No. I'm all right. I just have to collect my my wits. Yeah. You know, right. I connect. Gotcha. That's exactly what we do. And then the two of us connect and we make the the sum of the parts bigger than the yeah, sure. yeah. so anyway, um, Okay, we can go again. Okay. So we're at Sam Adler. Yeah, so Ernie Michelle, he's telling his story, and Sam Adler, and then the phone rings, it's the dean of the graduate school. He's sitting down, and then he proceeds to tell me that Sam's father, who was a cantor in Mannheim, had sung the bar mitzvah for Ernie Michelle when he was 14. And so, well, I gotta get to know this guy better. I'm talking about Sam. And then, um, I don't know that Sam and Ernie ever met in our, in our collaborations. They may have, I don't know. But um, Sam and Emily and I have become great friends. <sighs> a gentleman, 95 years old, we had lunch last week, he's written a book called Bridges Through Music, yeah. and it's a wonderful, a wonderful book about his career, and more than that, pictures of him being on the boat looking at the, at the uh, uh, Statue of Liberty coming with his parents. His father became a, a cantor in, in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, so then Sam went to Boston University, then to Harvard, and then all that stuff. But anyway, Bridges, Bridges Through Music, and it's just a beautiful, uh, trail of how music has made peace in places of war. One of the things that happened to Sam was he was drafted after he was, he got his master's degree in music at Harvard and then he was drafted in 1950, was sent to Germany. And he was a conductor, he was a musician conductor. And so the, the commandant in charge, whatever it was called in that particular area of Germany, called him in one day and he said, I understand you're a musician, we're having we're thinking we would like to try our best to get the German people back into communicating with us. And you need to read it in the book because the story is not mine. But, uh, but anyway, what happened was Sam went to the priest in the community and the chief Protestant pastor. And between the two of them, they agreed they should have a joint choir. And they started Messiahs at Easter time, Handel's Messiahs. And the first one was attended by Dwight Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, just before he returned to the United States. And it, it coalesced Catholics with Protestants, Catholics with Protestants with the U.S. Army, et cetera, et cetera. So Eisenhower sees Sam conducting with his corporal's uniform on, and he goes up after the concert, he gets somebody to go up and talk to him. He said, come to my office, we'll fit you with a new my tailor will fit you with a new uniform. And for the rest of maybe the year that he was still in Germany, he set up what became the Seventh Army Orchestra, hmm. which still exists, I think, uh, just as a result of that, trying to 
get people to people back again, back into things. So, and, and that story was, but anyway, so Sam and I have had just an awful lot of fun talking just about things like this. He's a connector like you and I are. You know, if I mentioned this or that, said I mentioned Walter Hendel. Oh yeah, he, and then it turns out he was the chair of the committee at Eastman that replaced Hendel, who went from Chautauqua to be dean. Hmm. Okay, uh, Chautauqua wanting to be a university. Well, Harper didn't stick around, and so what happened to Chautauqua's university's plans is that they're hidden in the archives at Chautauqua Institution. Had Rockefeller given, had Rockefeller been a Methodist instead of a Baptist, Chautauqua, Fairview, or whatever it's called, Fairpoint, would be that major research university that Chicago became. And this, the, the economy around here would be so different, but that's, that's a Necker's dream, you know? But anyway, so, so then this is me with the Jackson Center, but it's not just the Jackson Center. It then goes on, and then so I'm sitting here with you and, and, and I look at the, the things, the plaques around here, and they're really interesting, and I start to say, see something out there, and it turns out that it's the grant room. Well, you know, any kid that's had eighth grade history in the United States knows who Grant was. First place he became the general in charge that beat Lee and got the war over in, at Appomattox. But he was from Illinois, okay, originally. We were just, a friend of mine was, and I were just in Springfield, Illinois for a Rhodes Scholar. Can you imagine me being old like that? I have to go to Rhodes Scholar, right? <laughs> anyway, but I did. And it was on Lincoln, right? Okay, so Lincoln, and so you go to the old state capitol in Springfield. And here's Grant's office. Well, what's Grant's office doing in the state capitol? After the Mexican-American War, Grant sort of mustered out and went back to his hometown in Galena, Illinois. Lead, and Galena means lead, or it's like lead ore. Where his father was a member of a Methodist church, so he went to the Methodist church. Who guessed who the preacher was? John Heil Vincent, who came here to Akron and was the founder of Chautauqua Institution. So now Grant, you know, he uh, starts to sound like there's going to be a war, and then suddenly there is a war between North and South. So Grant becomes the commandant in charge to get an army in Illinois from all these areas around Lincoln country, right? And take that army down to Mississippi and Vicksburg and Natchez and all those things. Uh, and then so the war ends and eventually what do you do with an old general when you make him president, right? So Grant becomes president. So uh, one of the people that got Lincoln the He didn't, I wouldn't say he won the election for Lincoln, but he certainly was responsible for the nomination of Lincoln from the Republican Party at that time. He was one of the founders of the Republican Party, Horace Greeley. Republican Party poor, said to be formed in 1854 in Ripon, Wisconsin, and that's probably true, but Lincoln and Greeley, in Pittsburgh particularly, formed what became the modern day Republican, formed what became the modern day in 1860 Republican Party. Greeley gave the name to this group who were splitting off the Whigs, Republican. Now, who's Greeley? Well, back in the old days, when I went to school in Clymer, a long time ago, they used to talk about this guy, Greeley. Well, this guy, Greeley, Clymer, you know, we're Dutch. Greeley's not a Dutch name. How did he ever get there? Right. So, Greeley, Clymer. So, reading the grant room thing and realizing that the reason that this building hosted then President Grant was because this, I will give him really credit, very strong and able governor of New York State, Reuben Fenton, mm -hmm. sat across town in his old building, but he was really connected with this other dude who was Horace Greeley very closely connected. He was a Paul Bearer at Greeley's funeral. Did you know that? I did. <laughs> right. Okay. So anyway, so here's Greeley, here's Clyber, here's the Jackson Center, you know, isolated points that make it connect. So I said to myself, who is this guy, Greeley? And it turns out we, we knew, I knew, that his home 
was uh, on the Pennsylvania side of what is the state line road in Clymer, going east to west along Wayne Township, Pennsylvania, Clymer Township, French Creek, French Creek Township, New York. If I look hard from my home in Clymer when I was a kid, I could see Greeley's property. Now, there's a little bit of, you know, I'm making this up a little bit because it's two miles and there are a lot of woods in between. But imaginatively, I could see the Greeley property. So, all right, it's up there. So you drive up and it's just, you can't even tell what road's what when you get up there because it's still very bush, you know, heavy bush. So I had a friend from high school, Judy Camp Smoke. And Judy was in my class in high school of 26. Uh, her family home was two miles to the east of what I suspected to be the Greeley property in Pennsylvania. So I hadn't seen her in, we graduated in 1956, this was 19, well, this was 2018, something like that. So I got in touch with her and I said, what do you know about Greeley? Well, she didn't know anything. So we keep pushing things back and forth, and finally one time I'm here, my wife was quite sick at this point, so I didn't get here very often, but I did get here for a couple of days, and drove up past what was the Greeley property. It just happened that the daughter of the woman that lived in a house on that property was driving into her mother's driveway when I was up there. Now I find out what the history of the property is, that it was Nathan Barnes Greeley Greeley's brother that owned that property. And now we can start to make some real connects to the history of that space and how they connected to everything that was going on with the older brother, Horace. Horace was the family, uh, the Greeley family came from uh, East Pulteney, Vermont, which is on the east side of Lake Champlain, which is where they settled after they lost two they had two failures, the family, Greeley's father, had two failures in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and then ended up in Vermont. And finally, he came out here to look at land that he could live on for nothing. And he moved his entire family, except Horace, who had a job with a printer in East Pontley. They came by Lake Champlain down to the Hudson River, the Erie Canal, which was just opened, to Buffalo, and then he had taken, the father, Zacchaeus, had taken, when he was looking at the property near Clamor, he'd taken this lake steamer, and he was scared. So he got horse and cart, and the family, horse and cart, four daughters, one son, mother, father, horse and cart to northeast, because that's, if you had taken the boat, that's the closest to, because the lake, you know, twists this way. Takes the boat to north, takes the, goes to northeast, then over to Wattsburg. Roads are bad now, so he gets an ox cart. Goes to the, just inside the state line of New York, up over the hill, and by this time the ox cart doesn't go, so they walk. The next seven miles down the, on the um, state line road. Now we know this because one of the daughter's uh, granddaughter or niece, don't remember which, wrote a biography or a history from dictated by Esther Greeley, who was one of those daughters that came at that time. Okay, so and Judy found this somewhere. There are two, there's a Greeley High School in Chappaqua, New York, Clinton. There's a, the Greeley Museum in Chappaqua, New York. And there's also a, a literary, literature center in East Pulteney, Vermont, dedicated to Greeley. I happen to think that Greeley was very bright. His, um, his reputation was severe, severely marred by Thomas Nash, the, uh, the, uh, the cartoonist, the Civil War cartoonist, because he was easily mocked. And Grant himself said that had it not been for Nash, he would have lost the election of 1872. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, so this is stuff that Judy's found, you know. So anyway, so uh, so now I find out the Greeley story. Well, where's Horace and all this? He's still in East Pulteney, Vermont, but the printer closes, so he's out of a job. So he comes from East Pulteney, Vermont, to near, well, south of Clymer, two miles. How does he get there? 
Erie Canal to Buffalo, boat to Dunkirk, walk. So he walks from Dunkirk, gets in Clymer. Now we found out that there was a store in Clymer that goes back to about 1820. Necker's company now, but that, that corner was a store corner from 1820. So gets there, walks, gets to the store, 1820 at night. The people tell him, you don't want to go south through all those woods with all those animals, et cetera, et cetera. Not him, he just walks up over the hill and ends up in his parents' log cabin on, on the top of the hill. He stays there for about, this is now 1830, he stays there for about, um, in one form or another, until the spring of, well, maybe it's 1829, the spring of 1830. So he's there six months. And what's he doing? Well, he works for paper in Jamestown. And Christy Herbst would tell you it's the Post Journal, but I don't think that's right. But there's a, the paper didn't pay him anyway, whoever, so he quits. And then he works, eventually ends up in Erie and works for the Erie Gazette, or Erie Dispatch. And he's there for a period of time. And he isn't kind to Erie. So if you talk to Tom Hagen, he'll say, well, he beat up on us, right? And he did. I mean, there's no question. But then eventually what happens is that paper closes, and I've forgotten the, the Sterrett or something was the name of the, of the, of the Erie dire, uh, editor, gets from, from uh, Erie to... I mean, the, and all the time he's taking it, and this is something that, several things that have come up, come up that are pretty interesting. One is uh, both Lincoln and Greeley basically born the same time. Greeley was a little bit younger, 1811, Lincoln 1809. Both of them were worked for their fathers until they were 21 as though there was a rule that the oldest son worked basically to help support the family until they were 21. So Greeley would make money a, a little bit in Erie and he'd get it back to his father, Zacchaeus. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing with his father, Thomas Lincoln. And then when they, tw when they were 21, Abraham Lincoln went his own way uh, in Sangamon County and eventually ended up in the Army and whatever else. Greeley did the same thing, went back then at that stage when he was 21, he could get basically free, so now he goes to New York City. No money, New York City, starts what became the first daily newspaper, the New York Tribune, in about 1840. So anyway, this is Clymer. Well, what about Clymer and Greeley? How do we connect them? Well, some of us are cemetery hoppers. We go to the cemetery and look. If you go to the Clymer Cemetery and look, you find on the main road the burial place of the first climber settler whose name was John Cleveland. You go in a little bit and you find 11 Greeleys. Mm -hmm. Father, mother, Nathan, two wives, you know, there are 11 of them. I think, now Horace Greeley of course had a will and that was really contested and finally settled in 1879. But you could make a case that Horace Greeley still owns those 11 lots in the climber cemetery. Right, so, uh, but then he becomes founder of the Republican Party, strongly supports Lincoln, gets into the convention in 1860, the Republican convention in 1860, with uh, credentials from the state of Oregon. Why from the state of Oregon? Well, he didn't have his own credentials, but the people in Oregon couldn't get there because it was too far away. So they sent him their credentials, and he then got on the floor of the 1860 convention. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he pushed around and got Lincoln, basically, into the position of running for president. Now, the Democrats ran three people against him, and of course, that's, you know, they then lost. And by 40% of the popular vote, 40% of the electoral vote, of the electoral vote Greeley, uh, Lincoln wins the presidency. Uh, what what was Lincoln say? Well, we've got to keep the union together. Right? So on, uh, then you're down the path of Lincoln, the Civil War. What's Greeley doing all this time? Well, Greeley is really an abolitionist. He's writing both to Lincoln back and forth, lots of letters back and forth, but also he's, because they were, they were in Congress together for one term, Lincoln and Greeley, and they worked back and forth during the time that he was being appointed, I mean, uh, getting, Lincoln was getting elected, and then he was back and forth when he was in the, in the, uh, in the White House. So 1865, Lincoln's assassinated. What's going on? Reconstruction. And it was the matter of Reconstruction that got Greeley 
into the contest that was 1872, which was the grant. Greeley was a third party candidate, the liberal Republican, it was said. But he got two and a half, well, he got out of six million votes, he probably got 40% of them. Now, he then had the good graces as a losing Republican candidate for presidency, he died. So November 29th, elections over November 30th, November 3rd, Greeley dies. Okay. Now the Jamestown Journal is full of all sorts of, how do you find who, who gets all these electoral votes? And in the end, Grant gets a lot of them, and he then is basically by acclamation the president. And that's how, when it comes up, well, Fenton strongly supported Greeley because they were friends from way back. And then Grant comes to Jamestown by train, right? Got to go to Chautauqua, got to have lunch, got to have some whiskey. Uh, I made that up. Uh, well, I'm thinking whiskey and cigar at the end of the table. <laughs> isn't it? Right. And then and you probably know more about what happened when he got to Chautauqua than I do, but... He got to Chautauqua, gave a speech, I presume, and then turned around and went back to Washington. But Fenton, I think, came to the meeting, didn't he? Come to luncheon? Yeah, according to uh, yeah the, the stories, uh, he actually knocked on the door to pay his respects, yeah. as he was not on the official invitation. Is that what happened? He's sort of like the guy that wanted to get into the Georgia. Legisl Georgia governor's office when they were signing some of the industries. And, yeah, no, so anyway, so then we, then we start, now who's Greeley? So we've done an awful lot of strong background information. So Greeley's, Greeley's generation runs until 1845, then the Dutch come. And the Dutch are directed by Patterson, who was a governor eventually, who was the Holland Land Company's representative in Westfield. He said, you guys work, those guys over there, you know, the Greeleys and guys like that don't. We want you to go to Clymer and get it straightened out. <laughs> Almost. Seward had been in that position first. Seward being uh, the Secretary of War, and in, uh, I think it was Secretary of War in the Lincoln cabinet, uh, from New York, from Auburn. Uh, so how did I get involved in the Jackson Center? Because I'm a historian. Well, you and through that all, you uh, subsequently I remember your call uh, uh, expressing interest. You'd love to be on the board at some point. You become you become a board member and then ultimately chairman of the board. Well, that was, uh, I think it was the other way around. I think you called me. But uh, I did call you about trying to get Paul Freed involved here. But by the time that happened, could happen, Paul was very demented. And so he said, I just don't remember anything. He recognized that. So, uh, yeah, and that was, and that was, uh, a time of, well, I have to be personal. My wife got quite sick. And so in the process of becoming president chairman of the board, which I really, I cherish that because I'm a chemist. I'm not a lawyer. And I'm from the area, but I'm not from Jamestown. Uh, so it was a real honor to me. Uh, but Sue got sick. And as a result, uh, I couldn't dedicate the time to that, and that was true after that as well. Uh, but we did manage to, you know, sit down with Tom Hagen, and he gave us a major gift, uh, and that the proposal that Sue Murphy, who I, t I was responsible for uh, when I was chair of the board, uh, wrote, uh, is now what's responsible for all the changes that have happened here, which are just great. I think it's just the new entry and all the air conditioning and all those sorts of things um, are just, you know, hopefully there's enough, enough generation. And I just feel bad that I couldn't contribute any more than I did because I was just, a, I was taking care of sure. my spouse who was very ill. Uh, but... Um, and you've also uh, uh, memorialized your family in a fund at the Community Foundation of which the right. Jackson Center's one of your beneficiaries. Right, and that was, I give very strong credit to Becky Rollins. What happened was that I came here and met Raleigh Kidder and Becky, and it was at the very beginnings. You know, I think he, Raleigh wasn't either the first uh, Next to Dan Bratton, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, but Becky said, uh, well, you know, you can start a, an endowment fund for $5,000. My grandfather was a Jackson client. 
and uh, you, you know this story, but my grandfather was a businessman in Clymer, one of the founders of the Clymer State Bank. And depending upon whether you hear from my uncle or my dad, the Necker's Brothers store gave the Clymer State Bank either $10,000 or $20,000 in 1910 to get it started. So it was, uh, it was one of those things that um, connected with me, so I wanted to try and remember my grandfather's contributions. And of course, I have to be completely honest, I came from a town in which there were four persons, there were four groups that were really quite despised. This is World War II, Germans, Japanese, Roosevelt, and his minions, Jackson. Why? <laughs> because it was Republican, but it was more than that. My grandfather was president of the board or chairman of the board of the bank and lost a lot of money when the bank holiday happened in 1933. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell this story too because I was there when some of it happened. He paid back personally. There was no director and office of insurance at that time. You know, no internet, no DNO, no whatever. He personally paid back every client, every depositor, whatever the deposit was, when the, when the banks, through his own money at the end of that process. And he was, he was, for the time that I knew him, until he died, he was vice chairman of the board, with Garrett Tempest being the chairman of the board of the bank. Garrett Tempest figures in Jackson Center history because Tempest was the bank president and bank chairman that was sued by Earl Caflish over the riparian rights that were part of what was the upper pond in Clymer. And that was the first case that Jackson won in the Ohio, in the, where, where are we, New York? <laughs> in the New York Court of Appeals, I think, right? And I asked Kristen yesterday, now tell me, uh, where I asked Kristen recently, tell me how I'm, I'm from Ohio. We have a Supreme Court. You have a Supreme Court and it isn't supreme. How's that work? Okay. And so she explained this. Good luck, did she? No. <laughs> I can't. She couldn't either. <laughs> but so the appeals court uh, was now uh, it met in Sherman or Westfield or something, right? And the judge was an Ottawa who was from Sherman or something. So were they all just sort of farmed out? Well, they, I don't know if they met there in Sherman, but it was, I don't know, maybe all those courts of the county seats. Yeah, that's where it no, went. but it wasn't there. It was Westfield or someplace. It was, yeah. But then, then uh, and it, it, that case has generated some currency in riparian rights, water rights. Uh, and the case was about how high the water was in the pond because Tempest had an electric Late light company across down at the spill of, from the dam, and out of that spilled the water, and he needed water spilling over that. Earl Catholic wanted to float the logs across, but he didn't want to have the, the water so high that he had to lift them or do something with them. So they argued. So Catholic brought a piece of property. You know this story, I think. Mm -hmm. He bought a small piece of property from a guy who. And the guy either bank went bankrupt or died first. I don't remember which it was, but anyway. But he didn't, Earl didn't get it. I didn't know him. But Earl Catholic didn't get a deed. So when it came to proving that he'd bought that property, he couldn't because he didn't have a deed. And then, so that was the judgment that was found against him or in favor of the bank. Because the guy had a mortgage too. He had a, there was a, Foreclosure. I don't know all the details, but it uh, that that dam is still there, but it's washed out in the 40s. Okay, that's right. So, but so that was the Jackson case there, and I, I remember very little about Jackson and my grandfather. He didn't talk about him. Dad did. My dad did. But uh, and and when during the time that I was home, my grandfather's lawyer was a guy from Jamestown by the name of Pickard. Yep. Uh, Clarence Pickard. Clarence Pickard, big heavy fat big guy. guy. Yeah. And I never knew what it might have been estate things. I don't know exactly what they he'd come to 
climber and sit in chairs in my dad's house, and I wondered how the chair survived <laughs> as a little kid. So anyway, that and being chair of the board was, you know, it was a real honor. I enjoyed it. I only wish I could have really given more. Um, it, uh, you just play the, the ball as it bounces. Hit it if you can, right? So anyway. Well, you've done a lot for us here, Doug. Continue to do a lot for us. And, and I look forward to the day when you'll have this Chorus Greeley book ready, and then we're going to do a dog and pony show here. Well, that would be great, because Horace Greeley I have great respect for. Uh, he, what happened to him was that, uh, so Civil War Reconstruction, he tried to negotiate a peace at the end of the war between Confederates and Union mm -hmm. in Niagara Falls. You know about this? No. Oh, so he tried to negotiate on his own, a, a, you know, capitulation by the by the Confederates. Uh, 1864, he failed utterly. Didn't they just the generals, the Confederate generals, just laughed at him. Uh, and subsequent to that, of course, there was Johnson Reconstruction. Uh, Greeley was very much in favor of bringing the South back into the Union as fast as possible. He and Cornelius Vanderbilt and a couple of others paid the, paid the bail for Jefferson Davis to get out of jail. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Uh, so, and so uh, I'm talking about Greeley. Greeley. Yeah. And when he died, he didn't have anything left. He just had almost no money because he gave it away in various sorts. But he was so pillared by Thomas Nash and so made fun of, because he was visible. He was in New York, and Nash was in New York. And a newspaper publisher gets out there and tries to run for president. Well, he's just waiting, waiting for it. But he had strong convictions, a very moral guy, strongly connected with, with Henry Beecher, Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother. He was buried from Beecher's church in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, and we're not trying to reconstruct his name at all, but we're trying to say, you know, sometimes the little guy's got it right. And, and in that case, I think he really did. So that's one book. And then another book I'm writing, and this will be done before, is entitled, A Scientist Looks at Society Through the Eyes of COVID. This is my collection of op-eds, which is now close to 100, uh, published in papers all over the Midwest, particularly dealing with those issues that I can speak to scientifically a little bit, not expert, I'm not an expert in viruses, but a little bit, and how they pertain to what we're trying to do to ourselves, unfortunately, right now. Give me one more story and then stop. The road between, on the south side of Clymer, that's the state line road, mm -hmm. starts with Judy Camp's Smoke's house at the top of Spirit Hill. Do you know that hill yeah, coming? Hill. Right, okay, called Spirit and Hill. Towards Corey. Right, goes towards Corey. But if you keep going straight, you end up all the way across to the corner of the state of New York and Pennsylvania. So you got Wattsburg if you go this way and whatever it is, woods, I guess, toward solid west of Corey. At the end of that street, so under that road, is a farmer by the name of Mel Wallace, Mel and Judy Wallace, who have a mega farm. In the newspaper this past week, and I knew this of course, is reported the death of Scott Wallace, their son, from COVID. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, parents had been vaccinated, son was too tough. Politics control life. It just, so you look at that and you say, can't we as Americans be smart? Yeah. You know, this guy was tough, hardworking. His obituary said he worked from dawn to dusk seven days a week. But that weakness killed him. So many stories like that. Exactly. So many. so many stories. And the damage that they do isn't just to themselves. They spread the disease to others. Yeah. You know? 
And so I, so that's sort of where this, this uh, COVID through the eyes, well, society through the eyes of a scientist uh, in the time of COVID is coming from. And I'm really looking forward to putting that together. And when it gets done, we can talk about it sure. here too. But it should be this spring, uh, I would say. Yeah, the, so, the, the, uh, the room is always open. Ed is yeah. always willing to do this and add yeah. some real. We got Ed away from having to be a teacher today, right, Ed? Ed, what do you teach? Media literacy. Oh, okay. He's, he's, he's been with us since I know, the I know. He, uh, right, yeah. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure if you were here for that Whitney Harris thing, were you, way back when? Sure. Uh, was he? Yeah. All right, he's been, he was here before. We. Just a brief vignette, and then I know you got to go and I got to go. Uh, but uh, February of 2001, I, we had just met with, I had just met with Betty Lene, Carl Kappa, that whole beginning, yeah. in the beginning yeah, type yeah, stuff. Yeah. And uh, I hadn't announced it to anybody. Nobody no. knew anything. And Harold Adams. Oh, yeah, I had met him. Harold Adams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was going to give a talk at the town of Carroll Historical yeah. Society yeah. shortly after I met with Betty, which was hush hush. And so Ed and I, I called him, it's the first time, I said, Ed, can I borrow you and your camera and let's go grab Harold, yeah. the Jackson relative, he's going to talk about. Was he the only one alive in the area at that time? time? Yeah. yeah. Jackson. So we yeah. did. Yeah. And they asked me to give a little brief talk about, you know, what might happen. Yeah. And that's really the first time that it squeaked out. Squeaked out, yeah. And, uh, that, and I tried to be vague about it, but it, unfortunately, floss cast, you know, the whole, it was a packed house. Uh, but that, Ed, Ed was there capturing that crazy moment. So this was February 2001. Yeah. I think that the event I came to was October 2002. Yeah. You, you have yeah. a steel trap. Yeah, yeah, well, organic chemists do. In general, that's part of what, it's part of what, I'll tell you another story, then I'll stop. In 1986, I think, my daughter got a degree from Kenyon College. You know Kenyon well. Oh, very okay. well. All right. So we got there a little bit early, and we're sitting with my mother and dad and Sue and I. And standing on the dais was Elias J. Corey. You've never heard of Elias J. Corey. E.J. Corey was a professor at Harvard Chemistry when I was a student at Harvard. I'd never met him. He had just won something called the Japan Prize, which was gazillions of whatever the Japanese currency was, yen, I guess. And he was going to leave for Tokyo after this event, but he was getting an honorary degree from Kenya. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize a few years later. So, ah, in 1990, and there's a connection there. So, Corey's standing and standing alone on the podium, and I go up and shake my hand. I'm Doug Neckers. Oh, Dr. Neckers. And then he proceeded to tell me about the student 25 years earlier that my PhD dissertation had scooped in his laboratory. <laughs> I mean, and, and I stood there, and I said, I never met the guy. Didn't know him from Adam. And here he tells me about Sander Barsa, who was, was working on a project that I published from the University of Kansas, not Harvard or Yale, who, uh, that was uh, pertinent enough to cause his student to have to revise his dissertation and start over again. And I looked at I went back to Suzanne and I said, I don't believe it. Okay. Corey came back in my life in one other way, and that was. Um, October of 1990, so fast forward a few years. And the president, Bowling Green's president, had called me and he said, Neckers, how'd you like to go to Russia? I said, Russia, yeah, I don't want to do that. Anyway, he said, well, I don't ask you to do much. I want you to go to Russia. And so we went to Russia, negotiated a conversation between uh, the university and Mendeleev University in Moscow and so on and so forth. When I called Sue at home, well, Corey had won the Nobel Prize yeah. at that time. Okay. From that Mendeleev trip, 
came pretty much all the students I worked for the, with for the rest of my career at the PhD level. Not Americans, Chinese and other things, but Russians. Right? And, and uh, you know, you, you play the hand you're dealt. Yeah. You, know, it's, you played it well. I hope so. Yeah. Hey, thanks for this. Yeah. Thank you. I've been looking forward to starting to think about other things. Yeah. You know, you've been through it a little bit, but it just knocked me for a loop. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, Ed, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you.